Okay, it looks like we have the board here and um, we'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's afternoon session of um, April 17th, 2024. We have one uh, a substantive agenda item this afternoon, and that is our monthly um, AHEAD Global Payment Development Update, which will be presented by our Director of Health Systems Finances, Elena Barabee, um, Pat Jones, the Interim Director of Healthcare Reform at AHS, and Shule Garovich, our contractor from Mathematica, uh, where she is a senior fellow. Um, before we started, I also want to recognize that we have a number of legislators in the audience today. Um, I'm really appreciative of their uh, making time to attend the board meeting. It's the House Health Care Committee, chaired by uh, Representative Lori Houghton um, from uh, Essex Junction. And the committee um, includes, I'll try and see if I can remember everyone's name so everyone is um, called out, but uh, Representative McFawn, who is the vice chair, um, Alyssa Black, uh, who's a ranking member, uh, Daisy Berbeco from Winooski, Melanie Carpenter from, I think, um, Morrisville, uh, Brian Chena from Burlington, um, Mari Cordes, who's the uh, who's a nurse from Lincoln, uh, Penny DeMar, uh, Bobby Ferlis Rubio, Leslie Goldman, and Arthur Peterson, uh, Representative Peterson. So thank you to the committee for being here and making time to um, participate today. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to um, Ms. Barabee. Great, thank you. And um, hopefully my intro will be quick. I'm going to share the slides. Um, let me know when you can see them. You can see them. Full screen. Okay, wonderful. Um, great, so we will... First, we'll start with some background. So as um, Chair Foster mentioned, uh, you all have been kind of getting updates on the HEAD model and the Vermont specific Medicare hospital global budget payment design. Um, and so we've been kind of getting into the weeds and last time we met, there were a series of kind of higher level questions about how this fits in with broader kind of healthcare reform strategies and planning. Um, so today we're gonna kind of, you know, do a little bit of background, but really take a step back and talk about that bigger picture. I'll turn it over um, to our Director of Healthcare Reform, Pat Jones, and then um, Shule Garovich will help us kind of dig back into the weeds. Hopefully at the end, we have some slides for executive session if we get there. If we don't get there, um, we can kind of dig into the further negotiation details at a later date. Um, so with that, I'll just do a quick overview. You've seen this slide now probably hundreds of times. Um, this is from the Medicare slide deck. Um, it's kind of the ahead model at a glance. So this is a federal model um, that has statewide accountability targets, um, total cost of care growth target, a primary care investment target, and then a series of um, equity and population health outcome measures that would be included um, in a state agreement um, against which the, the state would be held accountable. Um, it also has kind of three major components. Um, one is cooperative agreement funding, that's to continue um, designing and possibly implementing um, in a head model in Vermont. Um, a hospital global budget, so this is a facility-based global payment. We, they call it a global budget, but it's really a global payment um, from Medicare directly to hospitals. And that is kind of the, the crux of what we've been talking about and um, what a, a group of stakeholders have come together to offer input on a, what a Vermont-specific design for such a payment um, methodology could be. Um, there's also a primary care ahead component, which um, Director of Healthcare Reform Pat Jones has talked about with you as well, that increases primary care investment um, on a population basis. I won't go into the details, but if you have more questions on the ahead model and, and the state's application, um, Director Jones is your, um, is your person for that. Um, but I did want to take a moment and just kind of remind folks, you know, there are a lot of Kind of terms being thrown out there, you know, the head model calls it a global budget. Um, we've been trying to get, you know, be more precise and call it a global payment. We actually already have a global hospital global budget of sorts implemented in Vermont um, through the hospital budget um, review that is conducted annually. Um, we set a cap on net patient revenue growth. Um, and this is saying kind of, you know, the, out of the total services, all the total revenue that is paid to hospitals for delivering care to patients, um, the total, the revenue cannot exceed a certain amount. Um, we know that's not perfect. Um, 
you know, and, and what this model offers is a way to control the actual payment going to hospitals. So it really makes sure that that budget, that revenue, that top line stays, um, you know, where it was budgeted in the first place. Um, and, and these budgets are really important. So this diagram on the right, I just kind of remind folks, like generally, what is a budget? It's kind of allows you to um, create a plan for what you're going to do and, and what you're going to spend and how you're going to spend it. Um, and then allows you to kind of control that spending relative to that plan and then allows you to kind of evaluate what you did relative to what you spent. So budgets are really important, but controlling actual payments when we want to bring down the total cost of care could be a really important mechanism um, to kind of hold that spending growth. Um, and I wanted to, you know, kind of summarize, this is really high level. There are more questions at the end. There've been a lot of questions from board members on what this model is, how it will be implemented, how will we design it? Um, what does it mean for Vermonters? How do we make sure we're getting the best deal for Vermonters that we can? Um, so I just kind of wanted to share some of these back to you um, and make sure that, you know, open it back up and make sure that we've kind of captured everything um, that you've been bringing forward. So. Will the AHEAD model or hospital global payments reduce Vermont's reliance on commercial insurance to sustain hospital financial health? Um, we've talked about the importance of, you know, wait times and recognizing where we are as a state, um, kind of the key challenges that we're facing and whether this model will directly address those challenges or whether we need to establish mitigation strategies um, to monitor, you know, wait times and access. Um, what is, you know, so Typically fixed budgets kind of incentivize um, reduction in service delivery. So how do we make sure that rationing isn't happening? How will we know if it's happening? How can we measure it? Um, what are the implications of this model for primary care and mental health access? There's a really large emphasis on behavioral integration um, as well as primary care investment. So how will that work and how will, you know, what are the intersections between those investments and hospital budgets? Um, and then how do the risks and opportunities of AHEAD differ, whether we implement on a voluntary or mandatory basis, um, and how are we defining that? So is it that, you know, this is an all-payer program, so is it truly mandatory for all payers to design a hospital global payment, and then is it mandatory or voluntary for hospitals to participate? And then what are the kind of inherent considerations um, of each of those strategies and what it means for you know, outcomes for Vermonters and affordability of care and those things that, that we want to see. Um, another thing that um, has come up um, is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So really understanding what our negotiating leverage is with Medicare. You know, where are we today? <laughs> and what is the alternative reality if we don't move forward with an application? Um, and what are the other levers or, or kind of things that we're comparing to? Um, and then I think, you know, building on some of the discussion this morning, what are the lessons learned from our current reform models? Do we have a Vermont-centered evaluation? What can we learn and how do we make sure we're taking that learning forward and, and wherever the state goes next? Um, and then what does this mean for financial health? So I, I won't read all of these, <laughs> they're up there, but I just kind of wanted to describe to you um, kind of what I've heard from you so far and kind of open it up um, for a discussion in a moment. Um, you know, but I think along these lines is, you know, the considerations for thinking about Vermont's particip participation in the AHEAD model. Um, how does the model kind of like, these are high level buckets, there's kind of more detail, more of a laundry list at the end for consideration. I know these are things that our Director of Healthcare Reform and others are thinking about, um, but, you know, what does the AHEAD model do for cost quality access, health equity, um, administrative burden, you know, it may not address everything. The healthcare workforce, for example, is not an explicit focus of this model. Um, but what does it mean for these various kind of goals um, or considerations? And then wh where do we need to have mitigation strategies or, or other strategies altogether if they're outside of this model? Um, so I wanted to pause there and open it up for kind of board member questions or comments and other you know issues you wanted to raise. Um, amongst this list and the list included the appendix, you know, what do you think is missing from these lists of questions and considerations? Which questions um, and considerations do you think are most important for improving Vermonters' access to high quality affordable care? And what work needs to be done before you'd be confident in implementing the ahead a head model or a hospital global payment. So, you know, we, there isn't much time before we have to kind of kick off our negotiations and submit a Vermont specific um, Medicare global 
payment methodology. Um, it's a mouthful. Um, so, but you know, given you know where we are, what what else can we you know put together to to help round out your understanding? So I'll pause there and leave it up to you to comment. Thank you. And just a couple of procedural things um, for for people in the audience. Um, the board's had a series of these meetings, and so if you're just tuning into these, um, <clears throat> a lot of this is an ongoing discussion, as Ms. Barabee said. And that slide was issues we've raised previously and are thinking about and contemplating. Um, there may be things that relate to our negotiations with CMMI. And if that arises, um, I or one of the attorneys or somebody may interrupt so that, that can be taken in an executive session so we don't disadvantage our negotiation strategies. Um, but I think the process here today is to try and work through some of this list and highlight things that we think are very, very important to do this or to evaluate doing this, and if we're going to do it, to do it right. Um, so I, I appreciate that. Um, a lot of people will recognize that this won't solve all of Vermont's problems. It may not solve any of them. It may make them worse. And the point here is to evaluate those concerns. And even if it doesn't solve all of our problems, that doesn't mean it might not be advantageous for us to do. But that's the analysis that we're trying to get to and trying to think through today and, and ongoing. Um, Ms. Barry, if you wouldn't mind going back, I think it was two slides. Here, yeah. So there's a lot here, and we went through them fairly quickly, and some of these have, I think all of these have come up previously. Um, but I'm happy to start the discussion on, on things that I'm thinking about and would like to understand as best as possible. Um, so. We had a couple things come up this morning, which is which is why I'm jumping in. But under the all pair model, one of the issues that we routinely annually confront is the blueprint and sash money being tethered to the ACO and to the model. And if the board regulates in a way that the ACO finds um, disagreeable, there's always a risk that they pull out and then we cost the blueprint and sash money. And that dynamic, I think, is something that's troubling and concerning because I don't think I think everyone, including the ACO, would hope that we'd have better performance by now. Um, so some of that is regulatory, some of it's just cultural and hoping and some of it's just not realistic. So that's one thing is like, how do we tie the money so that it doesn't hamper our implementation of the program? Um, another one from this morning that popped up in the ACO discussion was the commercial increases that we've had. We've had really, really accelerating commercial costs during the all pair model. The all pair model has not tampered commercial increases like we had hoped. And so how do we design an intelligent global budget that will do that here? That's a really big one for me. Um, I don't wanna see the commercial rates increase at the rate they've been, which is far faster than what we're seeing nationally. Um, and if people don't mind, I'll just say a couple thoughts that I had on that. We're doing the Medicare global budget now and potentially a commercial budget later, and potentially we'll be seeing the Medicaid piece, but those all need to interact and work together if we're going to not have them um, have an adverse consequence. And so I would actually like to incorporate, if we go forward with global budgets, a concept that's in our repertoire, which we've been considering, which is reference-based pricing. If we have savings from Medicare, and hospitals can access that additional money, we want it to be to the benefit of our commercial payers. In the all payer model, we did see Medicare prices flatten out, if not even decrease on a per capita basis. We did not see that on commercial. So if we're going to access the savings, we should have it offset the commercial market um, to alleviate some of the financial concerns for Vermonters. And our hospitals, we all know, are in a very difficult place financially, but they're also exceedingly expensive, right? Many of our hospitals will be seeing in the RAND pricing will be in the top decile in the nation. And so we need some relief on those commercial prices. So I'd love to see a mechanism by which we tap those savings from Medicare to alleviate the commercial pain that Vermonters have experienced the last seven, eight years. Another mechanism that I have been brainstorming, and I recognize I'm not the one creating the methodology, 
Um, but um, we have a cap or there's going to be an inflationary metric for Medicare. But I think there should be an inflationary metric for commercial. And Vermont health uh, hospital increases have been more than double medical inflation. I don't know why Medicare would be the one that gets the benefit of an inflationary cap, but not Medicaid or commercial. And again, there's another possibility that you tap the savings from Medicare, the additional monies from Medicare, and give it in situations where the commercial rate increase is lower. So you're not actually costing the hospitals more money, but you're not costing Vermonters more pain either. Also from this morning's discussion that are top of mind for me um, was the reality that in the all pair model, there's never been enough money. There's always a need and a demand for more money and a concern that access won't be there if we don't give more money. And so if there's a global budget, will that be enough money? And what do we do when it's not? Because in my experience here at the board, it's never enough. And how do we respond to that? Because for Vermonters, it is enough. So we have to think about that. And frankly, it takes a regulator to analyze that really well to determine if the increase should be provided. And that's hard to do. This morning, the fourth point I had was this morning we talked about um, evaluation of the all pair model and where did it not fulfill our expectations and why. And that analysis hasn't been done yet and it has not been measured from the viewpoint of Vermonters. So we have the NORC evaluation, we have the federal savings. We do not have that analysis for Vermont. And if we're going into a new model, if we decide to do it, we need to plan ahead so that we actually have an evaluation for the people who, for whom we get paid and for whom we represent. And so I would put in a strong plug that if this is gonna be done, we need to keep an eye on what it's doing to Medicaid prices and um, taxpayers and the commercial market here. Uh, two more, that's four. Um, my next one was, Ms. Barabee, you said that we're essentially in a global budget. And we are. There's a cap, there's an amount of money, and you can use it however you want. And the hospitals, we know, have significant market power and dynamics over the insurance companies so they can actually negotiate the rate increase and allocate it to different service lines how they choose. So if it's a 10% rate increase, they can put 20% here and 0% there and 3% here and 2% there, so long as the cap is um, complied with. And what we're asking the hospitals to do in the global budget is to put more of their resources into preventative care, which I think we all think is, is wise and to support primary care and mental health care, which we all know we desperately need. But to my mind, to some level, that could have been happening the last eight years because they could have allocated more money to primary care in those rate discussions with insurance companies. But that hasn't happened. And from our hospital budget process, we learned that Generally speaking, for good reasons or bad, I don't know, but a significant amount of the increases that we're seeing is going towards administrative costs, not patient care, not nursing salaries, not physicians. And so if we're giving a global budget, our experience with kind of a global budget is that the money isn't going to where we want it to go. And so I just think we need to be cognizant of that and monitor for that if we're gonna go forward so that we can ensure that that doesn't happen. There's also been effort this year to change regulation in significant ways. But if you change independent, transparent regulation, the ability to monitor for those things and to apolitically address them goes away. And all of us or none of us may be here in six years, but I think that would be a bad thing for Vermont. So if we go into a model and then three years down the road or two years down the road, there's no ability to monitor utilization and protect it against care rationing. That would be a net negative to me in Vermont. So that's sort of the summary of the five or six key points that have, have jumped out to me. Oh, I'm sorry, the sixth one was the starting point. We had a methodology that was presented to us last time, um, I think on the 1st, April 1st, 
and the methodology allowed for starting um, the hospital budgets at the base of where they currently are with some additional adjustments upward. And my concern with that is that if there's a finite amount of money, we're talking about proper allocation as a system and within a particular hospital. And the allocations that we have in some of the hospitals are aberrant compared to peer hospitals. They're not an ideal allocation. And I don't think any of us think we have an ideal allocation in the state. So if a hospital is starting with uh, an imperfect allocation and significant wait times and huge admin costs and huge commercial prices, is that what we wanna do? And if it is, we should do that intentionally and openly. And if it's not, we should discuss that. That this is a voluntary model and we're asking them to take less money when they're in financial peril. That's a really hard ask to do. So we're in a moment where we're sort of evaluating and, and critiquing and none of my comments are meant to say that I'm not supportive. It's more that we have a lot of work to do. And so those are those are the six things that have been sort of topical for me lately. Um, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so I, I'm actually really grateful for this opportunity because it allowed me to kind of consolidate some of my questions and concerns and interests um, in this model. And I really first want to say I appreciate all the hard work. I know how much hard work has been done by folks at AHS and, and, and the Green Mountain Care Board on this. I think the model offers us some really interesting options um, that are worth exploring. Uh, but Alina, you asked us, and you know, Owen, you started us with, you know, what work needs to be done before we would be confident. So I tried to consolidate my questions um, and interests in learning more in a, in a couple of bucket areas. And some of them will overlap a little bit with what you see on the screen. Some of them will overlap with what Owen just shared, but I, I think I'll just share them again. Um, and I've raised some of these questions before in various settings. So, you know, they're a little bit repetitive, I suspect, but just since we're doing this now, I thought I would share. So the first kind of bucket is a comparison of a head versus what that next best alternative is, right? Which I'm assuming is fee for service with potentially the MIPS quality payment program. But to me, I really need to understand, uh, you know, what are the federal dollars that would presumably be coming in under a head versus what would be coming in under that alternative fee for service model? And what analysis have we done or will we do to compare the incentives to improve access to care under a head versus the fee for service alternative? Similarly, what analysis are we doing to compare the expected commercial cost growth and premium affordability under a head and the alternative? Um, you know, how are the incentives to improve quality going to be different under a head versus MIPS, for example? Um, and then also what how much is this model implementation, regulation, monitoring and federal reporting going to cost the state and the providers under both a head and fee for service? I think those are important, um, you know, uh, numbers to uh, cost to understand. In terms of, Owen, you raised the voluntary versus mandatory. I, I would love to understand how many hospitals and commercial payers must participate and by what year to ensure that the desired health reform outcomes are, are materialized and justify the model imp implementation costs, right? What is the critical mass that we need for success here? Um, and again, understanding what are the lessons that we need to learn from our all payer model that we can, you know, factor into our decision about whether to go forward with a head and what are some of the um, non-starters we might have with the federal government in terms of negotiation that we really need. What have we learned and what can we use in our negotiations to get what's best for Vermont? Um, so that's the comparison for me that I really need to understand the next best alternative and what does that look like? It helps me understand cost benefits of going forward with a head. When I think a deeper dive into cost containment and hospital sustainability and transformation, you know, an analysis that ensures that the cost containment under a head will be achieved for all payer types. I recognize this is a model, um, it's an agreement for Medicare, uh, but it's, it's as Owen said, we have to understand for global budgets, what, how are these three budgets for commercial, Medicaid and Medicare gonna work together till we make sure 
that we're containing, we know we're going to be able to contain costs through Medicare. That's what the model entails. But Medicaid, through the global budget process, will also contain costs there. How do we ensure that it doesn't exacerbate cost growth for employers and households that are purchasing private health insurance? I really need to understand how that's all going to work together. And similarly, in terms of hospital sustainability, hospitals have historically relied on commercial price growth to remain financially viable. So if policy levels are going to be deployed to slow that commercial cost growth, whether that's through rate increases that are no greater than inflation or a commercial global budget growth that's on par with the Medicare and Medicaid budget growth, what, you know, how are we thinking about hospital sustainability and ensuring access to essential services? So you know, that safety valve presumably is going to close if we're going to really try and contain commercial cost growth. What does that mean for hospital sustainability? Um, and on that note, how are some of the Act 167 recommendations on financial sustainability of hospitals specifically going to be incorporated into the global budget methodology um, that we're going to be you know, engaging in? Um, you know, cost containment it requires the removal of of inefficiencies in the delivery system, whether that be high administration costs, unnecessary uh, administrative burden, low volume care delivered at, at high cost. So I, I really do also want to understand how efficiency is going to be addressed in, in the model or in the global budgets in particular. Um, and the other thing I think about here is, um, you know, cost containment relies on removing a lot of this avoidable utilization from the system. If we think that that exists and we want to you know, reduce costs, we might be looking towards reducing avoidable utilization. But that success requires increasing access to primary care and finding placement for current mental health borders and inpatients that are in need of long-term care that are basically languishing in our inpatient you know, uh, hospital beds. So given our current capacity constraints, do we have sufficient providers and mental health beds and long-term care beds necessary to feasibly reduce the avoidable care in the system and to increase access to mental to primary care to try and slow down cost growth. So in a sense, is our system prepared to achieve what we're asking it to achieve? Um, and to the point that Owen made about access, under global budgets, it's possible that you know hospitals could benefit financially from limiting delivery of services, right? This is the fear of rationing of care. So we're already experiencing insufficient access to primary care, long wait times for specialty care. We've got access barriers for mental health and, and long-term care. So I've raised this before, but I want to make sure that we're objectively monitoring patient access. Um, we've got a mechanism to do that, and we need to be doing it before we even implement ahead, right? We need to understand the pre and post. So we're recognizing changes in access and monitoring it carefully. And I don't know how we're doing that. I just need to understand that. That will um, make me more confident that we have the monitoring mechanisms to ensure that, that we're not compromising access to care in our system. Um, and so I think those are the questions that I have. I think you know some of them may be more challenging to answer than others, but I need some help in understanding those um, different areas for me to feel confident um, in moving ahead with ahead. So that's hopefully, I don't know if Elena, you're able to capture all or most of that. I'm happy to send some notes that I've jotted down if that's helpful. That'd be great, thank you. I'll, I'll jump in. I don't have too much to add beyond what um, Owen and Jess have had to say um, and what I've said previously. A couple um, high level things that I think um, should be highlighted further. Um, in our previous discussions about the AHEAD model, um, we have been talking about it as if it could increase our funding from the federal government. When the when the AHEAD program itself is meant to decrease funding from the federal government. It's a cost containment strategy for the federal government. And somehow we've had, we've trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, had discussions about increasing the funding. So I worry, I worry about that. The program is also meant to help identify and reduce avoidable utilization. Um, the data on Vermont's utilization has always been pretty excellent. 
I'm sure there's avoidable utilization. I'm sure there's waste. Um, however, it's much less when we look across the country. So our problem isn't excessive Medicare spending due to avoidable utilization. That's what this program is meant to address. Those are not our problems. Our problem is a lack of access to necessary care um, and runaway commercial prices. So I'd like to see uh, more detail about how this program, how we would modify this program in order to address our needs. I'm not convinced yet that it can be modified to address our needs. Um, programs also meant to address equity. We have equity issues in our state, but they're not the same as most other states. Most other states' equity issues are concern, are primarily concerned, not entirely, but primarily concerned with race. We're over nine, we're close, I think, to 95% white. So we don't have the same equity issues. And in addition, whatever our solutions are in our state, because we are so homogeneous, it will make generalizing our solutions to more heterogeneous states difficult. Um, based on previous slides, um, I think it was number nine in the last presentation, um, it used to be called bending the cost curve. The answer to Jess's question about the best alternative to a negotiated agreement is fee for service. That maximizes the trend line. And so I think she's done a, a an excellent job phrasing her questions in a way that would help us explore what else is possible. Um, but there's a sound argument from <laughs> what the way she's phrased it um, to not move forward with the al uh, alternative payment model. I think a detailed assessment plan from the state's perspective is um, is crucial. As Owen was saying earlier, we haven't had that from the all payer model that has been in effect for the last eight years um, to our detriment and to Vermonter's detriment. Um, that assessment should be done by an independent organization that's apolitical. And I think the Green Mountain Care Board is like that, but there's been uh, rumors of that being changed in order for hospitals to participate in the AHEAD model. The changes that have been suggested make it more likely that the, regula the regulated entity would be captured and favor more favorable to hospitals. So making sure that um, efforts are taken to reduce the likelihood of regulatory capture is important. And, and Finally, I'd like to see more detail about enforcement mechanisms. We found ourselves in a place um, over the last couple of years where we have seen trends that are worrisome. We've pointed them out, and yet we've felt there's very little that can be done about it. And we felt, for example, with this morning's presentation, that because of the because effective programs are tied to an ineffective entity with the a, with the all payer model that's in effect our hands are tied we have an underperforming accountable care organization that we need to have in order to keep funds flowing to programs that do work um, that doesn't seem like a wise agreement to have and it seems wasteful for vermonters so making sure that we are able to monitor, assess over time, and then act, um, and how we would act, I think is important to spell out. Thank you. I can go next, unless Dave, you, you wanna go? Go ahead. Uh, so for me, there's a kind of a fundamental question 
um, which is does the state want a role in shaping Medicare, shaping Medicare's payment policies or not? Uh, because I think if the answer is no, the state doesn't have a role, then um, the then there are other Medicare payment policies that providers can choose, and the state will be uninvolved in that. So I, I do think that, to Jess's point, looking at the alternative is important. Um, and looking at that alternative from multiple perspectives is important because I do think the financial temperature in Medicare fee for service with MIPS for Vermont providers is reported to be chillier or would be chillier than under um, potentially under a negotiated agreement where the state has some uh, mechanisms that to talk with Medicare about some of the unique issues for Vermont that many of which have been highlighted. Um, I don't think I have a lot of other areas to add other than that I do think it's important to really be comparing the options um, because I think there's a tendency with a new federal model to really uh, try and and see if that model will solve every issue and problem in Vermont. And of course it will not. This is a Medicare model with some alignments for Medicaid and uh, some federal dollars to that would come into the state to help move forward with transformation and payment reform. I guess I remain still skeptical that hospital system transformation is feasible under straight fee for service, other than in very small tweaks. Otherwise, I think we would have seen it, quite frankly, um, by now. So I guess that's really my only my only comments um, at this point. Um, I'll go back on mute. Thanks. I don't often get to go last, so this is a kind of a treat because um, there's been so many really interesting comments and um generates a lot of a lot of thoughts on my part and uh elena also your presentation um i think like many of us we spent a lot of time thinking about ahead and global budgets and our our, our current system and where we've been migrating to and, and how it's affected uh care delivery in the state through the hospitals um I, I don't really have like a completely like unifying uh, approach to my comments, so I'm just going to go ahead and some some thoughts that I have here. Um, so one is, um, I think something that I've been really perturbed by, and I think several people brought this up, is the tethering of the blueprint and sash funding to a health reform initiative, and. I could see several reasons why trying to figure out how to untether that would be really beneficial. And thinking about that, it and I think for some of the reasons that other people have mentioned why why that's problematic, but especially if we're in a voluntary model going forward with um, probably not universal participation, um, I think it does call into question how much how much we would get for the blueprint and sash and my understanding is in the current model and any future model it's not like this is a grant above the amount of money that we would get as a state from medicare it's part of the revenue that comes from medicare and when i think about that and i think about our current situation where um you know if we think about having one big bucket of money in our state where medicaid contributes what it can contribute and currently, you know, Medicare contributes what it can contribute, and the rest tends to rely on commercial. That commercial is the off valve for the for the bucket. And in our current system with blueprint and sash funding, uh, it comes out of shared savings. So shared savings go to hospital bottom lines, and when hospitals need more money, they rely on commercial. So one way or another. The blueprint and sash money currently comes out of a hospital bottom line. And if it was, if we had participation in the head model, it would still come out of some way or another the pot of money that Medicare would pay for healthcare in Vermont. 
And so I, I think we should maybe have a discussion at some point about how we can not have Blueprint and SASH so dependent upon participation in and success in a health, health reform model, healthcare delivery reform model, and, and, and pull those out. Because I think that complicates so much of what we're trying to do. Um, I, I also think really, you know, from Jess's comments and Robin and, and Tom, thinking about the best, best case alternative, what's the best alternative to negotiated agreement is really important to think about because I mean, currently we have letters of intention from UVM and Rutland, which means the rest of the state will be in the alternative to the AHEAD model. And, and I, think we, I think we really need to be spending a lot of time thinking about how that's gonna play out. Um, whether or not that's a mix of Medicare shared savings ACO participation, whether or not it's in traditional Medicare fee for service, whether or not we stay with our current system of managing uh, hospital budgets, whether or not we think about some system of, of um, reference-based pricing or other regulatory mechanisms. I think that really needs to be thought about and considered when we then consider what our options are with the AHEAD model. Um, I think it sort of ties into a little bit of what our, 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 our morning hearings about the all para model one and some other people's comments regarding our lack of real clarity and understanding an assessment of that program. Um, I think it was a really um, exciting policy uh, to be implemented. And I don't think it went the way we hoped it would go. We never um, reached the, the scale numbers, the scale targets. And I think that creates challenge in how we think about transformation and how a, a value-based payment system would affect how we deliver care. So meaning if you don't get everybody in, um, then the other system still is there. And I think that to a large degree, the big value-based transformation and delivery did not happen in Vermont. And if we do an ahead model, I think we need to be very realistic in what we can accomplish through that model, given that at least for the first few years, um, professional services, so the little p providers, providers like me, when we deliver care, we're in a fee-for-service model, but the hospital that I work for um, could be in a global budget. And there's some inherent incentives that become misaligned in that system. Now that hopefully will change, but even if we get a few commercial payers in, even if we get all commercial payers in in Vermont, there's out of state Vermonters that get care in Vermont. And I would hate to, dis to, to develop a system where a hospital's margin is derived from what they can recruit into the state and drive up fee for service for. Um, sort of combining two, two topics there, the realistic assessment of, of the past model, but I do think just to circle back to that, I really think we do need to do a very thorough um, evaluation and try to understand if there is a correlation or if there is causation between this steep rise in commercial insurance rates over the last several years and our um, agreement with Medicare and how the Medicare funding and, and uh, uh, revenue has been managed. Um, and the one last thing I want to sort of touch on here, I mean, there's so much, I mean, I, I'm thinking about this today. I mean, I wrote out pages and pages of thoughts on, on, on the head model, I think probably similar to several of you and trying to think about, you know, what are the risks? What are the benefits? What are the realistic, you know, um, predictable consequences that could be problematic? What, what are some unintended consequences? You know, what are some of the challenges we could have in implementation? What are some of the really amazing things that could happen from having a global payment um, and how that relates to what where we are in Vermont? But 
going to skip the pages and pages and spare you all. But the one other thing, I, Owen, you mentioned this concept of a of a of how we could tether an ahead um, model payment to reducing reliance on commercial. And I think that's a really interesting idea to think about. Is there a, is there um, some part of a of a incentive payment or an adjustment that can be made based upon maybe something like a rand commercial price to and, and have an inverse adjustment? So you know, a high commercial price could could you know be a reduction in a Medicare payment, and a low commercial price could be an increase in a Medicare payment, which sort of acknowledges. The, the cost shift, but tries to seek to undo that cost shift. So I, I think there's a lot to explore there and and maybe something really, um, maybe a tweak that could make this this model um, potentially work a little better for us. Um, but that's all I have for now. Thank you. Well, I think that fits into member Bunge's point, which is, do we want a seat at the table in shaping Medicare? And I think the answer is yes if we can do it in a way that's favorable and no if we can't and the devil's in the details and that's really hard um to do you know I, a lot of you know i went back and watched a lot of the old interviews around the all pair model one and spent hours watching them they're fascinating because a lot of it was about addressing mental health and primary care and reverse cost shift onto medicare and that was the goal, amongst others, and many of the goals have been achieved, but but those have not come to fruition as much as we'd like. And they were laudatory goals and the right goals then, but how do we do this methodology so if we shape Medicare, it does actually achieve them? And the other thing that sort of scares me is there's so much unknown. Like there is, there is COVID, right? And there's going to be a huge recession or another public health emergency or a demographic problem or a flood and it's going to throw all good intentions and all thoughts out the window it just happens so if we talk about potentially avoidable use we need to be very specific about how much money that is and what the care is and then to jess's point about system preparedness one how much is it Two, where's it going? And three, how? So theoretically, it's really attractive to me. And now the next level is the implementation and the, the, the reality on the ground. So when we speak with our hospital colleagues, you know, they have an incredibly difficult time recruiting nurses, paying for nurses, recruiting physicians, retaining physicians, housing physicians. And so if the model is premised on shifting care to more appropriate places for the patient and financial, um, where are those places? And if we don't already have them, what are the risks that they're not going to come? And then if they don't come, how do you handle a hospital that's in extreme financial distress who can't move the care they need to move to save the money to hit the target? That would seem really risky to me and um i don't know how you say no if they don't have that opportunity or how you even evaluate whether or not the opportunity was fairly available to them to move the care so you have a cap that might be too low for our hospital's financial needs and um so those are just the details i think that we got to figure out um and having said all that, and honestly, I'm a little scared of all of this and so much, and we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, but if well, it's we a have a thing, year, right? We have a year before the state agreement is finalized. Not, not for our method, not for our initial submission of the methodology, which is two months. That's true, but uh, the Medicare Global Budget methodology will not impact all of the considerations. I think uh, some of the considerations that people have raised are considerations that, quite frankly, should be monitored either way. For example, just raised access. If we know we have an access problem, we should be monitoring that now, regardless of what the, whether we do ahead or not, because we would want to know that that's getting better regardless of the payment model. Um, so I think, you know, part of what we need to do is figure out what do we need 
in order to submit a non-binding Vermont methodology versus what do we need before we would vote to sign off to move forward? I agree on the utilization. I mean, we, Ms. Barabee testified last week, I think it was, I mix up the weeks, but um, about the wait times and, and we don't have resources or money to, to do that study annually. And we don't have measures of utilization or provider productivity um, that we do as part of our process now. So making sure we have the funding to do that and the resources internally and the time to put it together um, is, is related. So I'm happy to talk about all of these more. And I think this is really fruitful. I think we have a, I know we have a whole number of other slides that might start digging in on some of these issues. And, you know, the reality is we're never going to have perfect information when we submit a request. We're never going to be able to do it as confident as we might want. But sometimes you got to do it anyway, one of the best you got. So I'm not sure if we can really prioritize these all now, but I wanted to I want to get it a little bit more to the to the meat if we if we can to see if some of these um, are things that we can learn a little bit more about. I saw a slide about some of the investments that Medicaid has made in a number of the uh, need areas in the state. So I want to talk about that and some of these other potential mitigation and strategies that we have to address all these concerns. Um, so if we're ready to keep talking, I believe I'll, Chair Foster, we should turn it to Director of Healthcare Reform, Pat Jones, is that? That'd be great. Pat, are you ready? I am ready, thanks. Okay, great, thank you. That'd be great. Thank you, everyone. Lots of food for thought in that prior discussion, lots of challenges that we face. Um, I was asked to really bring it up a level and talk about the big picture of healthcare reform and how a potential ahead model might fit in there. So that's what I'll try to do here. And um, you know, happy to continue um, discussion on the details as well. Um, but you know, just starting with fundamentally, what are the goals of healthcare reform? Um, when we, you know, all think about healthcare reform, it really is to seek to address. Uh, the challenges in our healthcare system, many of which um, were just touched upon. And, um, you know, we refine our goals over time, but they really revolve around um, some of the areas um, that were just addressed. And so first, um, you know, our goal is to reduce cost growth so that we can ensure that uh, both health insurance and health care are affordable. Um, as you all uh, mentioned, improving access to care is a really important goal, and that's really reflected if Vermonters are able to get care when they need it and where they need it. Improving quality and the experience of care for Vermonters um, is obviously a, a big bucket. Um, there are ways that we've uh, tried to measure that in the past and we'll continue to do so in the future, but really seeking to improve that quality and experience of care. And then population health, improving the health of the entire population so that we um, can have better outcomes and quality of life. In terms of equity, um, the goal is really to ensure that all Vermonters are healthy and well and have access to care. And then supporting our various providers that work so hard to care for Vermonters day in and day out. So those are, you know, that's sort of our um, general statement of what the goals are. And a lot of the considerations that you all mentioned uh, track with all of these goals. People think a lot about payment reform when we talk about health care reform, but it really is one component. The, the sort of the ultimate goal is to support changes in how care is delivered so that we do have better outcomes and population health for Vermonters. And so how we change payment or payment reform is one component of that. 
So next slide, please. Um, I was asked to give a, a history um, of healthcare reform in Vermont. And um, so I started with sort of fairly recent, the 2000s. But um, for those of us who have been around for a long time, you know, we can really look back at least to the late 1980s when um, Dr. Dinosaur was enacted in Vermont to provide uh, coverage for pregnant women and children, uh, community rating for, um, for health insurance was another um, policy decision that was made back in the late, late 80s. So, you know, it goes back before 2005. But if we start there, um, you know, 2005 was when Vermont was first approved and um, was, you know, a, a very early state on uh, the global commitment waiver payment mechanism for Medicaid. And what that global commitment waiver did was it really um, gave us some flexibility to engage in innovation. So um, expanding health insurance coverage, implementing um, innovative care models, accelerating some of our um, alternative payment models, strengthening care coordination and population health management. So um, the flexibility um, to engage in policy changes and in investments really um, is a cornerstone of that global commitment waiver and is still in effect today. And then in 2007, Vermont um, really took the step of expanding health insurance coverage through the Catamount Health Program. The idea was to provide affordable health insurance for Vermonters who qualified and didn't have access to employer insurance. In 2008, um, we piloted through Medicaid the Blueprint for Health, which is really our signature care delivery reform model. It focuses on establishing integrated health and human services um, for people with complex needs and advanced primary care. So Medicaid piloted it, but commercial insurers joined in 2010 and then Medicare in 2011. Then in 2013, in response to the Affordable Care Act, uh, Vermont Health Connect was launched, and um, that provides eligible Vermonters with health insurance and with premium assistance. And then 2016 is when the current um, Vermont all-payer model agreement was signed with CMS. Um, the first performance year for that model was 2018, Medicaid actually um, started in 2017, and, um, and that model is still in effect as we know. So that's sort of a quick, um, quick history of um, healthcare reform in recent years. Next slide. So, you know, as that slide and really the discussion um, so far in this meeting really emphasizes, we need multiple strategies for healthcare reform. There's not a single initiative that's going to address all the goals or all the considerations. Um, if we want to change how care is delivered for Vermonters across the entire health system, we really need to look at multiple ways to do that. If the ultimate goal is to change or transform care delivery, there are a number of elements that contribute to that. And so, you know, we're looking to achieve a stable system. We are looking for new ways to pay for or fund care. And that would include preventive care and community-based services, as well as your more traditional um, health care services. It's important to um, have transparent data collection and reporting. Um, a number of co your considerations really emphasize the importance of having data and evaluation. And then we need policies that can support those changes. So, 
you know, here in the state, and that includes HS, it includes the Green Mountain Care Board, certainly includes the legislature, the administration, and and we've worked over the years with our federal partners, uh, with our um, community partners. And, you know, we really have been working intentionally on many fronts for many years to try and address the underlying challenges. And it's going to take that extensive of an effort and it's going to take persistence to try to um, address these challenges and concerns. Next slide. So what I wanna do for um, a, a little bit is just talk about some of the investments that have been made in Vermont in the continuum of care, um, you know, that might not be addressed by federal Medicare models, but just to provide a sense of, of that intentionality and how we really are trying to address the broader system of care. So Medicare models don't always specifically um, provide funding or investments for the broader system of care. Um, you know, in some ways it makes sense because some of those services aren't things that um, Medicare is structured to pay for. Um, but they certainly have, CMS through Medicare, certainly, you know, its models look at encouraging cross-organizational partnerships so between hospitals primary care providers, mental health, substance use disorder treatment. You see that reflected um, in the AHEAD model as they've described it and in um, previous models as well. They um, often will highlight that there's a potential to eventually redirect funding, and you all have touched on that, but if there's savings in um, some aspects, how can they be invested in other parts of the system? And then Medicare also um, does in its models, it will sometimes waive certain Medicare payment regulations in a way that can allow providers to change the way they deliver care. A couple of examples of that are um, in Medicare regulations, there's a requirement that for a Medicare beneficiary to um, go to a skilled nursing facility, there has to be a three-day stay um, in a hospital. And in some of the models, um, including our current one, that requirement is waived so that uh, Medicare beneficiaries can go directly to a skilled nursing facility when warranted. There's another um, regulation that's being talked about as a, as a waiver where um, hospice care and, and palliative care can't be offered or curative care can't be offered concurrently. Um, and there's um, CMS has shown a willingness to waive that regulation for participants in its model. So there's a couple of different areas um, where they've shown some flexibility there that helps um, providers and members. Yes. I'm just going to interrupt for a second. Um, just one thing. So um, there's a hand raised. I just want to say we'll take public comment for folks um, when when the presentation's concluded. So so you can wait till then, and we'll take all the public comment people have. Um, and then just um, mindful of of time and um, all of that. I, I, I was wondering, if, Ms. Jones, you mind if we interject with questions, or do you prefer to just um, present? Some of these I actually had questions on. Some of these are more relevant, I think, to the immediate discussion, but also happy to wait if that's preferred. I defer to you, Chair Foster, whatever your preference is. Um, I'm happy to accommodate. You're our, you're our guest. I try. <laughs> um, well, let me let me ask this, because this one actually is pretty pertinent and it just jumped out at me. So the 164 million in Medicaid and base rate increases across the health system, I wanted to hone in on that a little bit because I think that's really important to some of the board members and some of the points that were raised earlier about system preparedness. Um, were those, uh, how were those, how was the 164 million determined? Was it inflationary or was it additional money above inflationary increases? 
And then can you speak a little bit to, I know I think it's in a later slide, where it went and whether or not you think it's um, sufficient to help address some of the concerns about system preparedness? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to address it in a general sense. If you want more detail, there are probably folks here at AHS that could um, provide better information on that. But, um, you know, uh, in some cases, we've um, done rate studies um, to see, you know, what, are, what does it look like to actually deliver these services and how does Medicaid reimbursement compare? And so, um, you know, as a result, the legislature has actually um, recommended some rate studies or required some rate studies as well. So, you know, it's a combination of where that comes from, but um, how do rates compare to Medicare rates? That's another um, benchmark that we look at as well. So there's a variety of ways that we assess um, how our what our rates look like, um, and you know we've we've instituted those, and then um, per, as as appropriations allow, and that you know the legislature is assisted with that as well, obviously, and the administration. But as um, budget allows, the the ability to um, bring rates in line with what some of those benchmarks or rate studies show. That's sort of the general approach. Again, there are folks who, if you really want to dig into that, who could give you more detail, but that's the basic uh, premise. Do you have a sense, I've seen various data sources um, about how Vermont pays on Medicaid, the Medicaid, Medicare fee index, the ranking of per capita spending from Medicaid. What's if you have a sense sitting here now? I know I'm just putting you on the spot, but do you have a sense of how Vermont, how well Vermont pays on Medicaid? Yeah, I don't want to get out over my skis on this one again because I'm not steeped in the details. But my sense is that we, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, and it may not feel adequate to providers, but that we we do in some cases. Um, pay better than what you might see elsewhere. I'll give one example. Um, we're currently paying 110% of the Medicare rate for primary care. And, uh, and um, my sense is that that's one of the probably higher rates nationally. But I, again, don't want, I'm speaking of things that I don't have super detailed knowledge about, so I would defer to others if you want to dig into that more. No, sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, sorry, you can keep going. Okay. Yeah, and that sort of—I was going to get to that that section anyway. But um, you know, while Medicare may not make those specific investments, they certainly help with the matching funds, and Medicaid really does focus on that broader system. So the base rate increases over the last two fiscal years. Um, you know, we do have ex extraordinary financial relief um, mechanisms, particularly for skilled nursing facilities and uh, private non-medical institutions that serve youth. Um, so there is that mechanism. We've made some targeted investments that really focus in on uh, care delivery. And I'm going to talk about um, a couple of these in more detail in uh, the next couple slides. We have been able to um, implement some workforce initiatives um, and also with the help of federal funding and enhanced federal match rate for home and community-based services, we've been able to provide grants um, to providers of those services. So that's sort of the broad buckets. And if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll get into a little more detail. So the 164 million in base rate increases in the last two state fiscal years, you can see the provider types um, that have seen um, some of those increases. So mental health and SUD treatment providers, primary care providers, uh, federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics, hospitals, dentists, um, home health agencies, adult day providers, 
and then other home and community-based service providers. So it's a wide variety of um, provider types. And then, as I mentioned, there's that extraordinary financial relief that can occur on a case-by-case -case basis. And then the how next- often the, How often does that the, occur? The extraordinary financial uh, relief? Uh, you know, I, I would, I mean, I would say it's, you know, definitely a couple to a few a year. Um, you know, I can get more detail on that for you, but it does come up um, from time to time on a fairly regular basis. So, just all different provider types. Uh, well, it's as I said, that extraordinary financial relief is primarily skilled nursing facilities. Um, there, there are services that are um, division of rate setting um, overseas. So. Um, skilled nursing facilities and then private non-medical institutions, um, sort of residential type care for youth. So we, we have a sort of similar situation just recently at the board. Copley came in for mm -hmm. a mid-year, which is really unusual. And it was mm -hmm. essentially on some level uh, extreme financial relief that was needed. And of course we only really control the commercial market. And um, it seemed, it struck me at the time that there's no other provider that can come before the board other than hospitals and say, hey, I'm having real financial trouble. Can I have more insurance money? In that case, we gave what we thought was appropriate, um, but it was really based on how low Copley's prices were compared to other peers and in Vermont and all that. But it really, you know, we hear a number of providers with serious financial concerns outside of hospitals, and we only do one sector. So I was curious about that a little bit. So thank you. Yeah. And we too, you know, that part of that is the rate increases, part of it's that extraordinary financial relief. But as you can imagine, we um, hear that as well. Thank you. So next slide. So in terms of targeted investments, these are um, some of the investments that have been made um, by the state. Again, all of us in partnership um, over the, but you know, with Medicaid dollars over the last um, couple years. Um, so first of all, quite a bit to augment the mental health crisis system of care. And, um, you know, a couple of you mentioned, you know, the challenges and access and um, what's happening in hospitals and EDs. So, um, you know, part of that is adding a 988 suicide prevention lifeline. Um, we're standing up mobile crisis services for um, mental health, and then also um, alternatives to emergency department care. Um, there is a, a um, proposal, an effort to expand uh, mental health hospital beds for youth, and um, that's expected in 2025. And um, there's also been proposals to increase um, residential treatment capacity for youth as well. Uh, supporting um, certified community-based clinics, um, they're called um, Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics federally. We don't use that term, um, but um, supporting exploration of those clinics through Vermont's designated mental health agencies um, with the goal of providing more comprehensive and coordinated treatment for people who are experiencing mental health and substance use disorder conditions. And then, um, I think you're all aware um, that the legislature um, approved funding for Medicaid to pilot through the blueprint um, embedding additional mental health services, uh, screening for health-related social needs, as well as mental health and substance use disorder uh, conditions in primary care. Um, and so we're, um, we've had about a year, a little under a year of that pilot, um, lots of participation from primary care practices and the blueprint is gearing up uh, for the second year of that pilot. So that's a significant um, undertaking. 
And then um, there uh, is an effort well underway to establish specialized skilled nursing facility beds for people who have particularly complex needs. And we expect that to be online uh, later in 2024. And then for home health agencies, um, uh, there has been provider tax relief for them. So those are some examples of targeted investments that we've um, been uh, making in the system. Next slide. Dr. Merman, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, real quick, uh, the complex need care capacity, is that the eye care yes. uh, facility or is that uh, something different? No, it's eye care, yeah, 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 thank you. Thank you, Dr. Merman. Pat, Pat, from the perspective of the question that we're trying to think about about the system preparedness, these investments are really critical and obviously at an important time. Do you have any thoughts about how we should assess these investments as to whether or not they'll um, prepare the system as the board members have indicated they're concerned about? Or how should well, we be thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, I you know, a, a lot of what we hear is that there's challenge in, you know, when I talked about the goals of healthcare reform, one of them was access to care when and where people need it. And so um, there um, is some information about how folks um, are boarding in emergency departments because there's not mental health um, care um, or there's not, uh, they might be in um, hospital beds because there's, they, you know, they need to go to either a skilled nursing facility or they need home health care. So there's some metrics that, um, you know, that uh, I think are helpful in terms of um, evaluating system readiness. That can be um, folks who are in EDs for more than 24 hours, say for mental health or um, or the number of beds that are filled by people who um, could benefit from a different level of care. So those are, you know, those are certainly some of the things that it's important to keep an eye on. And, how, you know, some of these investments are intended to directly address those issues. So. That's a really great point, right? So we can look at how many borders, how many people are going into the ED because they can't get the primary care. We should be seeing length of stay go down as these investments come come online and start working. We should see that those numbers move. That's great. Yeah, and That's I just want to emphasize again. I mean, I mean, you know. It it's there's not one thing that we can do that's going to fix all of this. We've got to, um, you know, assess what the issues are. That's certainly what we've tried to do, and I know you have, and certainly the legislature and the administration have done that as well. Um, we have to assess what these issues are, um, identify. Um, what we think are potential solutions to these issues. We have to keep at it. We have to do it um, in multiple ways because it's multiple um, types of care that we really want to um, stabilize. And we have to keep at it and be persistent with it. And it takes resources, but you know, smart um, allocation of resources can really help with that too, so. Do you, do you have any sense of, and, and maybe it's not for today, and maybe it's something we need to look at six months from now or three months from now, but based on those metrics, do we, should we have greater confidence that we're ready? I think, you know, I think we're seeing some of them go in the right direction. Um, there's still work to be done, for sure, but, um, but you know, we're we're seeing uh, you know and it's never you know like we want to get to zero on some of these metrics um whether it's long waits and eds or um not being able to go to a more appropriate care setting but um you know i think i think we have to um you know i think we're seeing some things move in the right directions it'll be interesting to see as we get more of these things online how that looks thank you yeah 
So um, a couple of other areas where we've been um, hard at work include um, workforce initiatives. So, you know, we've been partnering with health employers on um, retaining and recruiting, um, you know, healthcare workforce. There's in particular been some new programs to try and grow the nursing workforce. And we um, are in the process of creating a healthcare workforce data center um, that'll help us understand um, what our workforce looks like, what the challenges are, and uh, hopefully identify potential solutions that maybe we haven't thought of to date. This is another one where um, it's sort of an all hands on deck, multifaceted approach. I want to um, thank the Green Mountain Care Board. I know that um, our director of the data center has um, had some really helpful interactions with Green Mountain Care Board staff on that. So, and then for home and community based services, um, we just recently um, have um, stood up a, um, an initiative that. And again, this is with federal enhanced match. So I want to give credit where credit's due on that as well. But um, more than $17 million in grants are going out to support our HCBS um, providers. And there are four main buckets there that um, that we um, took um, applications for. One is um, investments in infrastructure. Another is enhancing workforce capability. A third is um, care model innovation. And then a fourth is strengthening provider processes. So um, lots happening in that, um, in that area as well. Next slide. So, um, you know, sort of bringing it all back, you know, that's the bigger picture. And I really do appreciate um, you giving, requesting and giving me the opportunity to sort of lay out that broader context. But when we think about, okay, how would the AHEAD model look in the context of that broader healthcare reform? AHEAD would be one component of our um, healthcare reform portfolio. Um, and it could, um, you know, offer an opportunity to address some of the challenges um, that we face. Like our current all-payer model, and you you all have outlined that clearly so far this afternoon, but, you know, what, what AHEAD does is, is it really allows Medicare to join Medicaid and commercial insurers um, in paying for health care differently than through a fee-for-service approach. There is an emphasis on hospital global budgets and also on primary care payments. Um, there's an opportunity in the AHEAD model um, for Medicare um, beneficiaries to receive or for practices to receive enhanced payments um, for their traditional Medicare beneficiaries. And there is a focus on care transformation as well, both at the hospital level and, um, and, and at the um, primary care level. Health equity is central to the model, and there's a number of ways that that's reflected in the AHEAD model. It would continue Medicare support for the Blueprint for Health and for the um, SASH program support and services at home. SASH um, is almost wholly um, funded by Medicare. So it does provide a mechanism for continuing that Medicare support. Um, not aware that there would be any other mechanism for doing so um, because they, um, CMS has been um, providing that funding through the model. Um, I had already mentioned waivers of Medicare regulations that help um, provide some care delivery flexibility. And then just as um, Director Barube noted, um, states under this model would be accountable for meeting targets related to total cost of care, um, related to increasing investment in primary care, and then for population health outcomes, including um, equity and quality. So that's sort of the context in the broader um, healthcare reform picture. And then the next slide, 
um, you know, is what we know about what the options are if Vermont does not participate in a head. Um, as was previously mentioned, um, you know, the clearest one is that there would be um, a reversion to fee-for-service payment, whatever Medicare pays, um, our providers would get, and providers would be subject to Medicare's um, merit-based incentive payment system, which entails um, reporting on quality and being paid according to results on quality measures. There are a couple of other existing national models that um, that could be options um, in lieu of um, ahead. Both are ACO-based models. The first is the ACO REACH program. Um, the Medicare CMS has closed um, participation to any new accountable care organizations. So the mechanism for participating in that model would have to be with an ACO um, from out of state that is already approved for ACO reach. And then um, there is the Medicare Shared Savings Program, um, which is also an ACO model, which is um, available still it's in statute so it's still available to um, ACOs new ACOs it also could coexist with the head um, it's a little unclear um, right now how that would look but CMS has said that the MSSP the Medicare shared savings program um, could coexist with uh, with a head. And then, you know, in terms of potential impacts, I think, you know, the prior slide actually outlines some of those, but um, you've touched on some of them, um, our ability to have some input into what Medicare payment looks like, um, the continued Medicare funding for Blueprint and SASH, um, you know, the, um, potentially some ability to um, look at prior savings from our reforms and build those into a new model. Um, there's, you know, there's a number of impacts if we did not um, participate in a head that, you know, should certainly be assessed as we evaluate this opportunity. So that's all I had today. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to um, share this. Um, I'd be glad to um, answer questions now, later, or um, in some cases would want to bring in people with more expertise than me on some of these items. So thank you. Thank you. Thank Can you I just that. ask a clear, quick clarifying question um, on the last slide? So these are options that providers could elect. These aren't options Correct. for the state of Vermont. They're options for that providers could elect. And so one provider could do MIPS, a different, as we've seen, we have a couple providers who've looked at other MSSP or ACO REACH programs, some FQHCs. That's, yeah, that's correct. And actually, um, board member Lunge, that really points out um, something that, you know, what you could see some fragmentation um, in the system if people just sort of start um, picking and choosing and um, and that could lead to more rather than less fragmentation over time. So thank you for pointing that out. Pat, Pat one question on this one. Um, one of the issues the board members raised in the beginning was um, the worry about rationing of care or the incentive to not provide more care. Um, how should we be thinking about whether or not fee for service incentivizes um, improving utilization and access as opposed to um, a global budget? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I can tell you how I think about it. You know, um, first of all, with the global budget, I think it would be really important um, to monitor um, key areas of utilization and make sure that um, you don't have unintended consequences. 
with fee for service, um, and you know, maybe you all see some of this in your regulation of hospital budgets and so forth, but you know, there may be an incentive to improve access and air and services that you know have a positive margin. <laughs> um, but I'm not it really depends. I mean, it depends on what the rates are that are being paid for different services. And there, I would think it would be really imperative to look at what's happening in different service lines and are are the area, because, you know, it could end up with more resources being diverted to certain areas that are not the areas that you would want to see improvements in access. So I think either way, you really have to um, look at what are the potential unintended consequences there and uh, monitor for that. And um, and under fee for service, you know, we wouldn't really have as much ability to, um, you know, sort of say this is where the dollars should be going necessarily. So. I think both require diligence. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I'll open up to the other board members. Any questions for Ms. Jones or Ms. Barraby? I could ask um, just, just a couple quick questions. Um, we had a discussion of blueprint sash funding in the last round here. What would you think if there could be a different funding source for blueprint and sash funding other than CMMI models? Would that that be problematic in any way that you can think of? I haven't heard them suggest that that's an option. So, um, you know, we had before. Well, I'm not saying uh, Medicare pays for the blueprint and sash. I say that I we see. have a different we have a different funding source outside of Medicare CMS to pay for blueprint and sash. Would that be problematic to you in any way? Do you think? Or well, I mean, it's you wouldn't probably... be able to you wouldn't be able to pay for it with Medicaid because there are federal yeah. restrictions on Medicaid funds. So I think yeah. the question is, what other source could that be? So could there be another federal source requiring, like, could Congress try to get an earmark or something like that? That could be a possibility. Um, otherwise, I think it would have to be state general fund um, that would substitute for the federal funds. Yeah, I mean, you know, Medicaid funding is intended for Medicaid beneficiaries, and Medicaid is already paying um, blueprint dollars. SASH currently is a Medicare beneficiary program. So, yeah, um, you know, it's a uh, it's a it's a challenge. You know, prior to um, the current model, we were part of the. Um, multi-payer advanced primary care demonstration model with CMS. And that's how we initially um, obtained Medicare funding for both um, the Blueprint and SASH. That program no longer exists. And um, But Vermont actually showed positive outcomes in the Medicare evaluation for both Blueprint and SASH. And so that's why Medicare um, found this mechanism in the current all-payer model to sustain that investment. And you all know this, but it's about, it's just under $10 billion a year currently. So. Yeah, I think the, the reason why I ask is it often becomes a major reason to, one of the sort of clutch reasons to make sure that we are in a, in a, in a model, which I think has some disadvantages to being bound to things like that. And yet we're spending a fair amount of state money trying to figure out the model. I mean, there's ways that, you know, there's a cost benefit analysis and we need to sort of think through that. There's cost to it, of course, but you know, there's, there, there may be benefit to it. But one other thing, I, I just get a little confused sometimes when we talk about reverting the fee for service. I believe we're in Medicare fee for service now, but through this ACO model. We're in free for service now, I think, right? 
Yeah, I mean, there's right now the model provides um, prospective payments, um, but it then reconciles the Medicare uh, component reconciles back to fee for service. So if, and, if the hospital like generated a bunch of Medicare um, charges and billing at the end of the year, the hospital would would get a reconciliation up, and if they if they were under and and uh, and it was beyond the shared savings, then they could get a reconciliation down. But the the net aggregate over time is a still based in fee for service, as far as yeah. I'm there's sure. a yeah. There's a risk corridor, but yes, you know there it is reconciled to fee for service. Um, the ahead model, you know, does just you know to be transparent, the ahead model does offer an opportunity to have that um full you know that unreconciled that really gets you more toward the unreconciled um model so no, no, part not, of it's not, like not so what we have future. now but we're not quite there and then part of it is what the opportunity is yeah just uh, came up earlier today that uh what was it there was a the percentage of medicare recipients in Vermont that are in our current model was about, it was up on the screen at some point today, it was about a third of Medicare beneficiaries are currently in uh, under the, under one care, I believe, is that correct? Uh, I mean, I'd have to look to get the exact number, but I, um, you know, it sounds like it could be correct, yeah. And then the one other thing is we talk a lot about MIPS and uh, I must admit, I, I am not a MIPS expert, um, but my understanding is too, that there's MIPS in the head, but it's like a MIPS light. Mm -hmm. but I, I also understand that a lot of the country deals with MIPS. So I think that the infrastructure, like in a lot of EHRs is already there to, to work through MIPS. But do we understand the difference between a head MIPS versus uh MIPS MIPS, or is that sort of a part of the negotiation process? Yeah, well, I think the other thing is we're still sorting out um, what the MIPS situation is um, under a head um, for uh, Vermont. But um, it's currently you know, being negotiated. So yeah, I just yeah, want to put that yeah. out there that to yeah. get into the weeds, we should talk about it in executive yes, session. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then well, the one last thing I, was that you know you you gave a great history of all these health reforms and i just was wondering if you could pick you know one two three of them you think you know just in a list are the most successful ones that that you can think of um hi there <laughs> um what are the most successful and when you look at that history and list of healthcare reform in Vermont, like where do you what do you think are the ones that that are, are the ones that just have really worked really well? Small, big, either way. Well, I'm gonna you know give you sort of everything. <laughs> um, you know, I think Vermont has done a good job of um, getting coverage. Um, you know, and I think the data bears that out that. Um, you know, the bulk of our, you know, residents have some coverage. Now, you know, you talk about the challenges in affordability, that's very real, um, you know, but, we, you know, we have been able to get premium subsidies for folks there, you know, but, you know, we want to look at affordability under, under insurance, but, you know, compared to other places, we, I think, have done well with um with coverage i think the blueprint um has shown um some real um positive results in terms of integrating health and human services you know setting up regional um community health teams a community health team in each health service area supporting primary care in their work with complex patients, serving as a springboard for programs like the Hub and Spoke and the Pregnancy Intention Initiative. So I think in terms of care delivery, um, the blueprint has um, has um, really um, 
you know, demonstrated some 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 positive results. I think for the all payer model, um, you know, we've seen things some pretty innovative payment models, and the one that comes to mind particularly is the. Uh, comprehensive payment reform CPR program for independent primary care practices. I think if you were to talk to um, some of the providers who voluntarily participate with the ACO, they would say that um, some of the data sharing has been um, really important. So I think there's been some positive um, results. And, you know, again, the um, Medicare um, evaluation showed um, some uh, savings for Medicare. So I think, you know, they've all had um, some positive results. Um, and again, you know, it's going to take a lot of different efforts. And, you know, I agree with you all that doing rigorous evaluation, figuring out what didn't work with some of these, what has worked is is really important um, in terms of moving forward. We won't know, we can't answer every question, but we can certainly try to um, continually um, try new interventions um, based on what we believe the needs are. So really designing based on what we hear people need um, and then evaluate, you know, working on implementation. I don't want to under under emphasize that because implementing these things is um, you know is is an effort. Um, so we want to have good design, we good planning, good design, um, strong implementation, and rigorous evaluation. Those are all really important things. I don't care what the payment or healthcare reform model is. That should be. Totally. I, I totally agree. I think yeah. we need to. I think I totally agree, and and I think we need to work on the evaluation component at least at least for some of the recent ones. But thank you. Thank you. From your perspective, um, are there any lessons to be learned from the all pair model, either in design and structure or from implementation that we could take forward into this effort? Um, I guess the first thing I would say is that it's really important in the design phase to um, to and you all have this conversation has really I think highlighted this, but as we look at the various um, challenges and considerations, it's really important that we. Uh, maybe everyone make sure they're muted. That might help. Thank you. Other that we, um, you know, set realistic expectations. I think we learned that, you know. Um, so, so we need to understand what models can and can't do. So, I think that's, I think that's an important element. Um, I think, um, you know, again, sort of having that cycle of evaluation. Um, so that we can learn as we go and make adjustments um, would be very helpful. Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, I think having provider involvement was actually a useful thing in this model. And I would, um, you know, want to encourage continued involvement and also just um, overall system wide for Vermonters, is it addressing the issues that are most important to them? So I guess those are a few things that I would say um, have been learning. So there are more, but um, that's what comes immediately to mind. Thank you, those make sense. Other board members have any questions? For comments. You didn't ask me about lessons learned, but I'm going to chime in anyway. <laughs> oh, no, please. Definitely. 
um, I so I think actually a, a lesson that we've not only learned but also changed the approach is in the depth of analysis on the payment model in advance. Um, there was nowhere near this level of uh analysis understanding or design that happened in the aco payment model it was pretty much vermont the medicare next gen with a few tweaks so i think that's something that already has been uh an improvement from the planning for the first model um as well as i think the stakeholder engagement has been much more robust so just a couple of things that I'd reflect on between the two. Um, yeah, just back one moment to the MIPS. The other thing that I think to think about is uh, to Dave's point around MIPS is that while we still we have things reconciled now, we providers aren't subject to the quality ups and downs and, no, and get the advanced alternative payment model increase. So I think straight up fee for service MIPS is less money, Just a, it's just frankly less money than current Medicare fee for service plus an alternative payment model increase. Now providers could get that potentially if they joined you know, the out-of-state ACO reaches like we've seen um, or the Medicare Shared Savings Program, because those, I think, both qualify or can qualify to those. So some of it, I think, that's hard to quantify is, is the financial impact um, on providers based on which model they would pick. So that's that's something that I think is going to maybe could be directionally indicated, but I think it's going to be hard to actually come up with a number. Yeah, I meant to actually emphasize that. So thank you, Rob. And um, yeah, right now, um, it, you know, as long as Vermont's in what's considered an, an advanced alternative payment model, um, the providers automatically get that quality payment because it links um, uh, payment to quality, and they don't have to do that reporting. And those are um, pretty significant things from what we hear from our providers. And to Robin's point about the payment model, I would argue that on the scale targets as well, um, it was clear um, going into that that some, you know, some, you know some, I'll just give some examples um, that, um, you know, Medicare Advantage plans, um, self-insured um, plans, those were going to be very challenging to get into the model. And so um, that was an area that I think, um, to Robin's point, could have used some um, more detailed analysis up front. So. Um, I don't think we'll have time to get to Ms. Garavich today. Um, any other board member comments or questions at this time? Why don't I open it up to um, the healthcare advocate? Uh, thank you, Chair Foster and members. Um, so first off, just appreciation for the presentations. Um, and also, um, uh, I, I wanna appreciate the conversation that has occurred today, I think it does mark a uh, uh, a lesson learned. Um, I don't think when we were entering into the APM, we had this kind of transparent conversation about concerns. Um, and um, so I just want to note that. Um, I, I also think um, uh, I'm soon to be followed by a, a bunch of public comments. Um, I think that's also really important uh, to be um, uh, hearing from people about what they're thinking and, ent and uh, entertaining their perspectives. Um, and so I, I actually think there have been some um, some lessons learned. Uh, but, but we do need to now learn the lesson about keeping muted, right? Um, so um, I, I think my, um, you know, my comments are going to be very much in line with the comments I heard from board members. 
um, moments ago. Um, I, I'll just go to, you know, I think Member Lunge's question, you know, do we want to have an influence of how Medicare um, uh, functions here in Vermont? Of course we do. If it is an outcome, I think others have said this, and I want to recognize it, if it's an outcome that really is good for Vermont, we can't know that until we've had uh, an outcome of a negotiation. So I, I do want to say, repeat what I think others have heard me say. I know there are people in the public sphere who are out there saying um, we should not be entering into this agreement, we should not be negotiating, we should not be applying for it. And, um, and I also know that there are many out there who are saying there is no choice, we must. And um, I uh, object to both perspectives. Um, from our perspective, it makes sense to do a negotiation and it makes sense. And, and then very much in line with what I heard the board saying clearly a moment ago, it makes sense to do uh, a really um, complete due diligence about whether the outcome of that negotiation is indeed good for Vermont, not just good for hospitals, but good for ratepayers, um, good for broader hospital system. Uh, provider systems, um, and uh, and yes, good for Vermonters who are seeking care. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, all of that boils down to, I think we really, we, we have to be prepared to walk away from it if we don't feel like it meets those standards. Uh, I really appreciate Member Holmes's frame of a number of uh, levels of questions um, uh, in, in very much in line with that same kind of analysis. And, um, um, let me just look at my notes. I think, you know, again, I think others have said this. I think the the um, uh, the outcome of the um, Bruce Hamery work, the Act 167 analysis, um, also is uh, is a whole other line of discussion that um, it's hard for me to understand exactly how it fits with the ahead discussion, um, but I think it's uh, uh, very important. And um, and then finally, I do want to make a comment about blueprint about blueprint funding or about funding for these important programs. Um, just uh, connecting the dots, I think um, the legislature asked for an analysis from Blueprint about alternatives fund for fundings. I think it was last year's Act 167, um, and um, and the Blueprint did provide. I thought a pretty good analysis. Now they were answering a different question than I think is being asked here. They were answering a question about alternatives to the commercial payments for Blueprint, um, um, but it is at least a start of a discussion about uh, an alternative way to fund Blueprint. And if you haven't seen it, I think it's worth spending a moment on it. Uh, with that said, I look. Uh, uh, I'll stop speaking and um, look forward to hearing from. Um, the many Vermonters who are on the call. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Um, I, I just want to know, I really appreciate the public commenters and people that take time to digest this and think about it and analyze it. I've said it before and I've said it again, but it's my, probably my favorite part of the job or one of them anyways, learning from what everyone else is saying and thinking. I'm going to... Uh, Hey, Ham. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Um, so anyway, thanks for everyone for tuning in and paying attention and helping us think about this as well as we can. So Ms. Wasserman, I see your hand is raised. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Julie Wasserman. I worked for the state for over 20 years. Um, I'm currently working independently and my focus is health policy. Vermont, like other states, has a health care system dominated by hospitals. Roughly half of all health care spending in Vermont goes to hospitals, and their ever-increasing costs are unsustainable. Not only are these costs unsustainable, they're starving the rest of the system. Primary care, mental health, home health, substance use services, they're all struggling to survive. And interestingly, these are the very services that would actually reduce hospital costs. 
unfortunately, AHEAD does not address our dwindling supply of primary care physicians, nor our nursing shortage, nor the grave lack of funding for mental health and substance use services, nor home health. AHEAD does not address affordability, of the lack of access to care, or the long wait times. In essence, in my view, the AHEAD model does not address Vermont's most pressing problems, and it will distract us from doing so. The most egregious aspect of Vermont's AHEAD application is that it undermines and effectively disenfranchises the Green Mountain Care Board because it shifts the development and oversight of hospital budgets to the Agency of Human Services. The Green Mountain Care Board is an independent body and not subject to the whims of the executive branch. I'd like to underscore the board's independence and how it is uniquely positioned to control the state's unsustainable hospital increases. On the other hand, the Agency of Human Services serves at the pleasure of the governor. The Green Mountain Care Board's signature component is its weekly open meetings, its uncompromising insistence on public input, its transparency, and its due process. These characteristics are all in stark contrast to the Agency of Human Services approach to a head. Their AHEAD model, as I mentioned, transfers development and oversight of hospital budgets to the Agency of Human Services. AHS is currently meeting behind closed doors with the hospitals to determine a hospital payment metho methodology for a head's hospital global budgets. Do we want hospitals deciding how to regulate hospitals? Do we want hospitals setting their own payments and designing their own budgets? Do we want UVM Health Network running the show? This is the current playbook under Vermont's proposed AHEAD model. Many of Vermont's hospitals may not want to participate in AHEAD because uh, the majority of Vermont hospitals would lose their cost-based Medicare payments. These are the critical access hospitals. If hospitals do not participate in AHEAD, their primary care practices are not eligible for the $17 per member per month Medicare bonus payments uh, that has been discussed a lot in previous meetings, but I don't think it's come up today. But one of the carrots that uh, AHEAD offers uh, is the $17 per member per month Medicare bonus payments. Uh, unfortunately, it only lasts for the first three years because then it becomes a part of the total cost of care and could be compromised. But in terms of this um, uh, hospitals, um, in terms of uh, the hospitals who don't participate in AHEAD would not be eligible for this Medicare bonus payments. And it's cause for concern since the majority of Vermont's primary care practices are actually owned by hospitals, as we all know. Since so many of Vermont's primary care practices are owned by hospitals, the Medicare bonus payments will largely bolster hospital revenues instead of the primary care physicians for whom the bonuses are intended. By the way, the same thing happened with One Care's ACO primary care investments, which appear to have gone to the hospital's bottom line instead of the primary care physicians themselves. AHEAD's hospital budget caps mistakenly focus on overutilization, as has been mentioned today, uh, when Vermont actually faces an underutilization problem due to the lack of access to care and the high costs that deter people from seeking care. And also already having been mentioned today, under AHEAD's budget caps on hospital spending, hospitals could potentially withhold the most expensive care from patients who need it most. The AHEAD model will dramatically increase administrative costs and complexity. We are such a small state. AHEAD will either, AHEAD will cause further fragmentation of our healthcare system 
and greater administrative costs since not all hospitals and not all insurers will participate. Instead of pursuing the AHEAD model, Vermont should consider the following, all of which are within our purview. We should strengthen and fortify Vermont's primary care physician and nursing workforce through aggressive retention and recruitment initiatives. We should pursue initiatives that improve affordability, access to care, and equity. And we should focus on initiatives that actually reduce the need for hospital care, which include, as I've mentioned, increased access to primary care, mental health, and home health. We should also immediately increase funding for mental health and substance use services. As I've mentioned previously, since August, the Howard Center has closed four programs and suspended another two programs. That's six programs in all. Centerpoint, intensive family-based services, autism toddler community program, public inebriate program in St. Albans, Act One, and the bridge program. Is this not a wake up call? We also need to develop initiatives to identify and eliminate avoidable hospital care and unnecessary ER utilization. And lastly, I think we should create a statewide global budget for hospital capital expansion. Hospital capital expansion, since this kind of capital expansion is one of the biggest drivers of escalating costs. In conclusion, there has been no analysis of either the costs or the benefits of Vermont's AHEAD model, and the potential outcomes are unknown. AHEAD's hospital budget caps are a flawed model for Vermont, given that the majority of primary care practices are owned by hospitals. My point is, is that AHEAD's hospital spending caps could actually reduce access since the caps disincentivize hospitals from expanding needed primary care services. Now, why is that? Well, costs would rise due to the pent up demand for primary care, which could, which, which could cause hospitals to go over their cap. In no way do we want to limit or inhibit primary, primary care utilization or growth. Vermont should forego the AHEAD model, which would remove oversight of hospital budgets from the Green Mountain Care Board and hand it over to the Agency of Human Services, which wants the hospitals to help set their own payment methodology. By diminishing the role of the Green Mountain Care Board, the state is weakening accountability to the public, whom we're supposed to be serving. And lastly, I would like to say that Vermont should forego ahead, which will lock in much of the status quo with an untested nine year model, allowing for little to no progress on Vermont's most pressing problems of access and affordability. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wasserman. Thank you, Ms. Wasserman. Thank you, Ms. Wasserman. Thank you, Ms. Wasserman. Oh, hey, Ham, would you mind muting? Thank you. Um, I'll get to you. I see your hands next uh, after Ellen Oxfeld. Ms. Oxfeld, how are you? Yeah, hi. Thank you very hi. much. Um, um, I really appreciate that the board is taking a critical and evaluative um, kind of, you know, position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the AHEAD model before they move ahead or even decide to move ahead with a AHEAD. Um, here are a couple of mm -hmm. further considerations um, that I would like you to um, you know, Julie Wasserman raised a lot of great points. Here are a few further considerations. Um, the first is, um, you know, the AHEAD model is another kind of value-based care experiment. And the last Congressional Budget Office study found that value-based care experiments have cost billions rather than saved money. So we really should think about, do we want to do another value-based care experiment? Um, now, this should not be surprising because uh, these value-based care experiments, I believe, uh, proceed on a faulty premise. They, they seem to assume that our healthcare woes are based on fee-for-service, and they think that some form of managed care, we can call it value-based care, is the solution. Um, but the history of managed care is uh, rather dismal. Now, where do they get this idea? The idea 
somehow is that fee for service induces providers to over treat and order too many tests and that's not supported by the evidence and if we look at mm -hmm. other countries we'll see that many other wealthy nations with national health care plans um and that have lower cost per capita and more accessibility uh, may utilize a fee for service as part you know for part of their portion of care they often have some kind of mixed um mixed situation um so you know i think our healthcare costs clearly the excessive administrative costs of our current multi-payer system are one reason for our excessive costs uh, we know that over a third of our healthcare dollars don't go to healthcare uh, they go off to profit seekers and profit takers in the middle um, of the system um, so that's something for us to consider now as far as the global budgets or what you call the you know global payment model i can I can see that if we had a single payer system, I could understand how a global budget would work. But I have a really hard time trying to figure out global budgets or what you call global payments in this multi-payer messy system. How is that going to work without just creating more admin and more Byzantine involutions? And you know, we are getting more and more Byzantine because our system is so complicated um, that even with you know several PhDs, sometimes we might have problems understanding it. So I I don't think global budgets are a bad idea. You see them in other countries, but I don't understand how that's going to work first off in the current system that we have now. And then I would also add, as far as primary care, you know, we all genuflect before the altar of primary care. We all understand that the single thing you can do that would improve overall population health is making primary care accessible to all. If we could do that with a universal publicly financed primary care system has been suggested in many bills. This would create a fair reimbursement rate for providers, a lifeboat for providers and patients. Um, and indeed, I would think a universal primary care system would mean that many providers wouldn't have to join a big hospital system because they could hang up their shingle wherever they want to hang it. And, um, you know, they could be reimbursed fairly and Former board members such as Alan Ramsey have suggested that a universal publicly financed universal primary care system would be a great first step in ensuring that uh, primary care is accessible to all Vermonters. And we all agree that's very important. Um, so that's, you know, those are my my additional comments. Um, and, you know, I just read an interesting um, report today um, pointing out that in the last quarter, United Health made eight billion dollars, and they made most of that not from their private payers, but um, by sort of leeching off of managed care, Medicaid, and Medicare programs. Um, so you know, these uh, private payers in the middle are not going to help us. Um, I do believe we need to move to a publicly financed system. Uh, but in the meantime, I would really caution against moving ahead with a head uh, for several of the reasons I mentioned. And I really think this whole um, analysis that, you know, if fee-for-service is the problem, and we've been trying this <laughs> for a long time now, since um, Act 48, which wasn't mentioned in the presentation, by the way, I needed to be up on the slide, it was left out. Um, but of of um, Miss Jones' presentation, I believe. Um, but um, we've been kind of going along with that assumption, and the Congressional Budget Office study and many other studies you can look at them nationwide uh, show that you know that is not the problem that ails us. So um, I think we should think very carefully. I would say don't move ahead with ahead. Um, I don't think fee for service is the only form of payment, but it's certainly not the cause of our ail ailments. Um, and those are my comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Davis. Now you can unmute. <laughs> there. Can you hear me now? Yes, uh, sorry, uh, Walter, would you mind muting yours? Um, I'm sorry, this may be my computer. I, I don't know how to do this. I'm sorry, it might be, yeah, it might be you. Um, that's you. <laughs> sorry.
Uh, Mr. Davis, while we do this, why don't we um, while we go, you might have um, two systems on, like a phone and your computer you hear me or now? something. Like that. Yes, that sounds great. Thank you. I I can't hear him. I can hear you. You sound great. I don't know. Um, Kristen, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Could could I trouble you to maybe, if you have Mr. Davis's phone number, maybe call him and see if he can help. I'll give him a call. Thanks. Sorry, sorry to ask you to do that. All right, we'll um we'll go to uh, Walter. Hey, Walter. Hey, Owen. How are you? I'm I'm good. How are you? Uh, interested. Um, you and I were in telepathy when you made your six points about the head model. I was thinking the exact same thing, though not as well as you did. Um, so I give you the kudos there. And I just, I back up Ellen and Judy Wasserman. I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Number one is what would this AHEAD model do for a patient? I tend to approach these things from a patient's perspective. In other words, someone who goes into an office, needs something done, and suddenly has got to go through all these convoluted problems in order just to get that. Um, <clears throat> Cost is a big problem. I just got hit with a $300 deductible bill. I'm paying over $4,000 a year now. I'm on Medicare, but I've got to pay supplement. I got to pay Part B and all that. So that's about $4,000 a year, and I'm still getting hit with all these deductibles. The AHEAD model, what exactly does the AHEAD model do for a patient? going, and I never heard anything about that outside of general accolades to affordability and all that. It's the same question I had with the ACO when we started it. What would that do for a patient? And <clears throat> Pat Jones's reforms uh, reform list was pretty good, but again, it doesn't list that the reforms that they made were almost like putting deck chairs on a Titanic as it hit the iceberg because <clears throat> the deductibles, the co-pays, all of the problems, the eligibility issues that we face are still with us, were not addressed, and are even more acute now. People can't go to the doctors a, because they can't find one, as we know, and B, because the deductibles are often too much. And when you're down on this level, making, <clears throat> you know, typical Vermont salary to be hit with a $5,000 deductible for a, for a procedure or a test is crazy. The next thing I want to talk about is when we talk about payers, and I know the board is tired of me here, tired of hearing me say this, the payers are not the insurance companies for Medicare. They are the distributors. They are the middle people. We, the people, are the payers. We are the ones who pay them to supposedly pay the physicians and the hospitals etc the medical providers and then they and and this doesn't always happen you know again deductibles and co-pays so i echo all of the concerns that all of the board members had uh, mike fisher and julie wasserman and ellen but i want to ask since a healthcare system exists for the patient or is supposed to exist for a patient what exactly does this complicated <clears throat> NASA-like head model do for an average Vermont patient who needs care? 
And I haven't heard that outside of various ge general generic terms. I, as a patient, I almost died at the hands of our of our healthcare system. I came within an inch of it. And it was for claim denials, prior authorizations, out of network issues, and on and on. Just endless, endless problems that I would not have encountered in a nation with single payer systems that Ellen had mentioned earlier. What would this AHEAD model, if we adopt it, which I hope that earnestly that we do not do for a patient, whether they're on Medicare or whether they're stuck on private insurance or whether they are uninsured. I'll drop it there. Thanks, Owen. Yeah, nice to see you. So I have a couple of sort of high level responses and if Ms. Jones wants to chime in, she can, but um, you know, I think a lot of what it will do for a patient is unknown until we have the methodology done and until we have it developed a little bit further and negotiated. So I have to speak a little bit theoretically in this answer, which is probably unsatisfactory, well, to me and probably many others. But theoretically, if we are able to get these savings back to Vermont and we're able to use it in connection with lowering commercial, well, that would be advantageous to the patient and the and the, the the real payers, as you point out, Walter. So that is a goal for me, and I think that's a goal for all of us. If we're going to do it, is there a way to make it offset these commercial increases, right? That needs to be a focus and a goal here because we didn't achieve it in the last model, and so we need to if we're going to do this one. The other theoretical possibility of what we want to do and we'll work towards doing and then evaluate if it makes sense if we can't do it, is does it open up opportunity for hospitals to be able to provide some of the care that we're not they're not able to provide now? So what I mean by that is I, I would love for hospitals to be able to provide more mental health. And I think a lot of them would like to be able to provide more mental health. People can dispute whether or not they can afford to do it or not, but it is certainly less financially advantageous for them to provide mental health at this point in time because of the way they're reimbursed. They're not, whether they're right or they're wrong, they're judging it that it's not in their financial interest to provide it. And this would remove that barrier for them. That's the goal. Again, theoretical, depends on design, hopeful, yes. But from a patient perspective, that is what we're trying to endeavor to do with this model, is to remove that financial barrier from them doing something that's more population health um, uh, positive, right? And um, I, I think that that's that's really it. The other thing is really how well can we design these utilization metrics and the care rationing um, uh, design around the care rationing risk, right? I will be very transparent that the board, myself, we have not come to where we need to be on evaluating provider productivity, access, wait times, utilization. We're not there. We're not there today. We weren't there last year. And we need to get there really soon because we're giving rate increases without actually knowing how good the provider productivity is. And rationing is a concern with a program like this. It is, as Member Walsh said, there's some goals of it that help prevent increased utilization, but we're in a place where we actually want some more utilization because we have such absurd wait times. And those wait times can be deadly. If your cancer diagnosis waits a week or two weeks or three weeks, you can die. And Walter, you've made these points many times. So a goal would be that this I, requires us and we do a good job of measuring those things. And we haven't to date. So it's to be determined if we can and if we have the resources to do it. I mean, you're looking at the hospital finance team. It's three people with 14 <laughs> budgets and three and a half billion dollars in three months. OK, if you look at the board schedule and what we have, it is nearly impossible to take the time to work on this model to work on hospital transformation, to improve all of our regulatory processes, nearly impossible. So that's a massive risk to this program is that we do not have the capability of coming up with access measures and utilization measures. If we do, maybe we can start making a dent on some of those wait times that are absolutely unacceptable for patients. 
Um, so I appreciate the question. I think it's the right question in a lot of ways, Walter. So thank you. I go back to the HMOs, to the value-based care, and I keep wondering. I mean, I know you're stretched out for staff and everything else, <clears throat> but that's just, you know, what, what does it do? <laughs> so, so think about it, right? I mean, we had a very long list of questions and concerns that are very serious questions about whether or not we're going to evaluate this model and whether or not we're going to do it. And they're real questions and they need to be answered for us because the hospital system and the whole system is too fragile to not do the proper diligence to go forward. And I point that out because you see who comes every week for these hearings? It's Pat Jones. We have very minimal resources to do this work, right? And at the board, we have Robin Lunge working double time with one staffer. So even the work that we do now is severely understaffed, in my opinion for an effort like this, and everyone's working really hard the best they can. But I'm not sure if we have the resources to do what we want in the time we have. All right, I rambled a little bit, so I apologize. I'll keep it moving here. Um, I, I believe that um, Mr. Davis is uh, on the phone with, um, with Kristen. So Kristen, if you can put Mr. Davis on, that'd be great. Go ahead, Mr. Davis. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I apologize for my computer, which is evil. Um, the uh, it, just, it was just uh, much of the comment today. I I couldn't really I couldn't really follow. I just here's a, a couple of things that I would say about it. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting, and I think it, you ought to take into consideration, um, the whole ahead thing um, is all about way out there in the future working with trying to do something that would satisfy the uh, feds at Brockville. Um, one of the things I think is a mistake from, for, from, from the Vermont perspective is I think that most people, that too many people consider the feds to be some kind of godhead that they really, that they just control everything, that they know everything. And the, the truth is that they're not. They said they, the federal government people suffer from the same problems that everybody else does. They have the, the, the issues get, get, especially the political ones become really, really, really attractable. The second thing I would so I so 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 I really don't care about the about a head. What I care, what I think is that I think we're going to have a we're going to have to solve our pro the problems in the Vermont healthcare system very soon. Probably certainly get them partly solved in in in, in actually in this year and very significantly solved in next year and and that's an fy25 and that and and those fy25 budgets at uh, 25 budgets are now in train in every hospital in the state uh the second thing that i think is uh, i find that i i just can't understand people talk about people spell a lot of we got comment today about how this is a voluntary system and we have what do we do about that with we don't have a voluntary system in Vermont, and the the fact is that the fact is that the there may be the, the uh, individual hospitals may have some kind of freedom to invite, to avoid the ahead problem, but what the hospitals don't have is can't avoid is the power of the Vermont Health from the Green Mountain Care Board to set their budgets. So if the Green Mountain Care Board really decided this is the way we want to go, and 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 then then as far as what then and but it was let's say for example look, that it was that was opposed by some of the hospitals and approved by other hospitals, the, the fact of the matter is that that you have you have total control of those budgets. You can set them, establish them in the legal term. And so in in fact, in fact, that's the one thing that Pat Jones left out in our history. The biggest single change in this history, the single biggest change was 1995, when the Vermont legislature gave uh, the, the state government the ability to control hospital budgets. 
The idea that you can't, that having that power, okay, means that you just can't do anything, that you run around in circles, that you really don't know where you're going, uh, it, that's, that's on you. I mean, the, the, if you want to get, if you've got something, if the Green Mountain Kia Board can decide itself, okay, what it wants to do, then it has the power to do it because it can compel, because it can just simply say to a hospital, um, uh, you, 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 know, you don't have to join up here, but, uh, but uh, we want to prove your budget and so in any event that's that's the that's the extent of my comment i i don't really i don't like the ac the uh head thing because what we've had is 10 years we've had 10 years okay of the all-payer model where we were supposed to get to supposed to get to uh level four which was the federal target on on uh on, on uh capitation now you can argue about cap, and, and I'm not interested in those arguments about capitation. If somebody somebody thinks that if somebody thinks that we can get to health care costs in the United States under control, okay, with chief of service, go for it, okay. But there's fifty, there's forty nine other states. Look around, what's happening? Those those states that completely the health care costs in the United States are totally out of control, and so in any event. Um, so those those are just my comments. Um, and, I, and again, uh, oh, and I'm really sorry about the computer. I'm I'm going to trade it in. Thank you. No, no worries at all. I appreciate you staying for this and um, for working with Kristen. So thanks thanks for doing that. And Kristen, thank you very much for getting getting um, Mr. Davis on. Um, Mr. Hage, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Chair Foster. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mark Hage. I'm testifying as the director of benefit programs at the Vermont National Education Association. And I'm also a trust administrator for the Vermont Education Health Initiative, which is a self-insured risk pool that provides health insurance benefits to 35,000 school employees active and retired. And my comments today will focus primarily on the global budgets or global payments aspect of the AHEAD model. And my objection to AHEAD is grounded primarily to the fact that it does not center the imperatives of affordability and access. And I do not understand why we would move forward with a model of that nature, especially one also that I do not believe is going to help us to rebuild and revitalize our community care system. My introduction to how CMS would likely propose structuring global payments via AHEAD came, I believe, at my first meeting of the Global Budget Technical Advisory Group. I was invited to join this group very kindly by board member Lunge, and it has been an intellectually challenging and informative experience, and I'm grateful for it, despite my pronounced lack of technical expertise in the field. Uh, but what surprised and disappointed me at the first meeting is to learn that that particular advisory group would not actually be exploring budgetary or pricing mechanisms aimed at reducing hospital costs but rather at designing a model or coming up with recommendations for a model to bend the rising cost trend going forward. So this meant that the starting point with respect to hospital global budgets would be the current and unaffordable level of hospital spending. So AHEAD's global budgets, as I understand it, would be anchored initially to baseline spending level derived from recent hospital budgets. And this baseline then inescapably would bake in costs incurred from high levels of potentially avoidable care and emergency room utilization, which in turn would exacerbate the crises in affordability and access. So a global budget structured in this particular fashion has no direct or immediate answer to the challenges that Mathematica's research posed, which showed that 22 to 37% of combined inpatient and emergency room revenue at Vermont hospitals is potentially avoidable. And whether you accept the low end of those calculations or the high end, we're talking in either case about large sums of potentially excessive spending. Confronting that, I, I wrote a memorandum to the advisory group, and here's an excerpt from it. Respectfully, how can the research findings just alluded to, combined with the current hospital prices and their harsh impact statewide, not compel a serious and sustained analytic effort to find systemic ways to reduce hospital costs. And that approach continues to inform and drive my thinking. Let's say for the sake of argument that AHEAD does succeed 
and actually slowing, not lowering costs, but slowing the growth trajectory in hospital spending. How will that concretely improve the lives of Vermonters who are trapped now in a healthcare system that, as I said, for many of them is unaffordable, inaccessible, and inequitable? And how will it dramatically improve the scope and quality of community care in Vermont, which, as Julie Wasserman noted, is starved now for resources and personnel? And of course, we know the substantial savings can be found if potentially avoidable hospital costs and ER services are provided instead in lower cost community settings, such as primary care, mental health practices, and home health. So I would propose that before we transition to the head model of global payments, that the state should undertake three urgent reforms that I believe AHEAD does not speak to or address sufficiently. And the first is to identify and propose remedies for the causes of unnecessary avoidable and low value hospital care. The second is to launch a multifaceted, multi-year initiative to rebuild and revitalize our community care system with a bedrock commitment to provide affordable access to primary care, mental health, nursing services, and home health. Consistent, I would argue, with the principles of Act 48. For me, I think of this, and perhaps this is exaggerated, but I think of it as a state-based Marshall Plan for our community care services. And finally, I would propose that we rationalize, standardize, and lower hospital charges by referencing them to Medicare rates in shorthand reference-based pricing. And my final remarks will be devoted to reference-based pricing. This board heard a detailed presentation last year by Marilyn Bartlett at the National Academy of State Health Plans and Chris Deacon of Verisan Consulting on this issue. Um, you know that Ms. Bartlett led a path-breaking initiative in Montana on behalf of 31,000 state employees and their dependents, and through direct negotiations with hospitals established a reimbursement range of 220 to 225 percent of Medicare prices for inpatient care and 230 to 250 percent for outpatient hospital services. An independent actuarial analysis found that that effort lowered costs by as much as 47.8 million dollars from 2017 to 2019. I would add that there has been no increase in premiums for state employees or contributions to their insurance premiums by the state of Montana since 2017. In 2017 as well, Oregon passed a law that set its hospital reimbursements for public sector workers and their dependents, including school employees, at 200% of Medicare payments for in-network care and 185% of Medicare payments for out-of-network services. The legislation applies to 24 hospitals out of 62 and affects 300,000 public sector lives and their dependents. An independent analysis of hospital claims data by researchers at the University of Michigan and Brown University, recently published in the Journal of Health Affairs, estimated that Oregon reduced spending in the first two years by $107.5 million, or 4% of total hospital plan spending. State audits using actuarial methods estimated the savings at $171.7 million. So whatever number we're talking about here it represents an awful lot of money saved. And also much closer to home, we know that State Auditor Doug Hoffer and his team released a report in November of 2021 looking at reference-based pricing with their own methodology on behalf of 25,000 covered lives in the state employees plan and estimated annually that savings by moving to a reference-based pricing methodology could yield somewhere in the neighborhood of $16.3 million. And again, that was just for the state employees' healthcare pool. Other states have also launched reference-based projects to control hospital costs, notably North Carolina, Colorado, Washington State, and Nevada. I won't go into the details about those states at present, but when I submit this testimony, I will append a document I created for the National Education Association last December on this issue in those states. Reference-based pricing benchmark to Medicare is a sound methodology for repricing hospital care. If this country was actually building a national health care system, Medicare rates are where the conversation would start on how to pay for medical care. I see no reason why we should not have an informed, data-driven conversation about reference-based pricing and hospital expenses in Vermont, just as Montana, Oregon, and other states have done. And to do this, in tandem with the other issues I spoke to, addressing very aggressively 
excessive spending in hospitals and ER utilization, and also, again, rebuilding, revitalizing community care services. And I would insist that hospitals be at the table for that, that they play a leading role and commit to those efforts. If we do those things in tandem, I think we can conceptualize, build, and transition in time to a sustainable and just global budgeting model for hospitals and potentially for the entire healthcare system. Thanks. Um, Mr. Hange, I had a couple responses to what you said or just thoughts that came to me and then maybe a question if you if you were inclined to um, share any additional thoughts, but on the Medicare rates and managing to Medicare, you know, we're looking at a demographics problem in Vermont that's really going to result in our state aging quite a bit more than we currently are. Yet our larger hospitals, our PPS hospitals are um, roughly speaking, 290, 300 plus percent of Medicare and annually requesting, what, five to 10 percent rate increases on top of that. So those are exceedingly large amounts and exceedingly large increases. And I think our medic, our, our commercial pool is just shrinking. So to me, managing to Medicare is not just desirable. It's the only option. I can't disagree. I mean, I, I don't, I, again, I, I'm always sort of struck by the fact that we can't even have the conversation, right? Is that I, I know looking at Montana, looking at um, Oregon, looking at what other states have done, that they have managed to bring down hospital costs and to the best of my knowledge, not actually harm their hospitals. So, in fact, Montana has, I believe, five primary care centers for state employees, and I think even enhanced their primary care services as they were going through this process. So it seems to me, starting at that point, what is a hospital's, what are hospitals' actual expenses? What do they need in the way of revenue? They have to be fair and, again, empirically driven assessments. But the idea of aligning revenue with actual expenses and knowing that it's been done in other states and that it, I see no reason why it can't be done here just seems like a logical approach going forward to me. Um, well, there's expenses and, and, and there's some volition and choice in those expenses, right? Do we put it to admin? Do we put it to tech? Do we put it to expanding a new practice, doing another practice or service line that might not, have, you know, there's a lot of choice that goes into that. So I had suggested earlier when I first spoke about the head model, a concept of incorporating your suggestion on reference-based pricing to be a metric by which hospitals would be entitled to additional Medicare bumps. Hmm. So you can't get the Medicare bumps unless you're getting to a more appropriate level over an appropriate course of time uh, on, on uh, Medicare, or sorry, on commercial pricing as compared to Medicare. It's an interesting idea. Um, I, I think it's certainly worth exploring. You know, one of the things that struck me when Chris Whaley testified um, last year also to this board, um, and he raised reference-based pricing, but he also brought into play Nashby's analysis of what they called the break-even point, that point where revenue and expenses are aligned as best as you can. And it was noticeable to me, certainly, I'm sure to you, that there's this gap often between what we are paying hospitals relative to Medicare and what Nashby shows their break-even point is based on their analysis. And it seems to me somewhere between those two numbers is where we can land on a reasonable reimbursement rate. And the idea of, of bumps for hospitals using that system seems eminently rational to me. I don't see why we wouldn't explore that as well. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Thanks. Is there any other public comment at this time? Okay, great. Ms. Barbie, thank you so much. Ms. Jones, thank you for putting together your presentation and, and speaking with us and engaging with us is really helpful. And I appreciate the board member conversation and, and thoughts. I really enjoyed the hearing today. So, um, We'll let Ms. Jones go and we'll just turn to whether there's any new or old business for the board. Hearing none, um, I'll move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in, fa all in favor?
Aye. Aye. Thank you. Everyone have a nice afternoon.